It's not working. All right, we will, we, we will move right along. Um, my talk today is, is talking about uh, PSAT 2. It's the culmination of my uh, 27 years at the Naval Academy and all of my previous uh, satellites. This is my ninth. And um, the unique things about this satellite are, uh, when you look inside, is this massive one-inch solid uh, thick block of lead because um, I negotiated, this is a one and a half U CubeSat, so two of them go out together and the other guy was going to be underweight, and so I maxed out the weight that was left so that I would have twice the orbit life that he will. And the other thing is you'll notice the camera port and any other holes that I have to drill through the side to see space, I always reserve that for the corners. And the reason is, is whenever we have students building satellites, they swear the design is perfect, everything's going to line up, and then they, and uh, the solar panels are a long lead item, so you build those pretty early, early on with where you think the ports are going to be, and they never end up there, and so you end up, we had a beautiful satellite, but during integration and everything else, they found out the propulsion system missed the hole through the solar panel here, and every, so by the time they were finished with the Dremel tool, more than half of the solar panels were cut up and hacked up and everything else. So I make sure that uh, I don't have to drill the camera hole until it's absolutely done, and now we know where the camera is, we'll drill the hole. Um, slide one. So what's inside PSAT 2 is it's a full-up CubeSat. It's the first one where we had enough money to buy real space uh, solar cells, and the solar cells on the side of a one and a half U CubeSat, if you buy them from a commercial vendor, is about $20,000 to give you three watts of the space-rated high-efficiency solar cells. Um, here's the stack. I have just a standard tiny track four um, packet system uh, that does you know, the telemetry command control, APRS, Digipeter, everything to do with packet. And then there is the attitude dynamics control CPU, which is just simply looking for where's the sun and uh, controlling the attitude uh, if anybody ever got around to writing the software. Then there's the uh, touch tone uplink and the voice downlink uh, CPU on its own card. Then there's the PSK31, which has a 10 meter uplink uh, linear receiver and a UHF uh, downlink transmitter. And if you're going to be transmitting down an audio waterfall, why not put a slow scan TV camera in the middle of it? And so you just stack up the boards. And oh, this is the, uh, the relayed out Tiny Track 4, occupies only about a half of a three inch. Uh, card. Um, and of course, for anybody who was here yesterday, here is the uh, $20,000 uh, solar cells on a CubeSat to give me three watts. At home, I have 1,000 times more power for one-tenth the cost. So again, anybody, any fool who's waiting for higher efficiency solar cells before he's going to invest in solar, forget about it. Um, how do I get from here to there? Okay, so this is what um, block diagram-wise PC, uh, PSAT-2 does. It, um, it has, again, the VHF uplink and downlink, 145.825, like all the other APRS satellites. Then, uh, but it also, uh, you can send an APRS message up, and it'll speak it on the downlink. Then we have the PSK-31 uh, uplink and downlink on HF and UHF. And of course, because we have the audio uh, coming down, why not put a slow scan TV uh, on that UHF downlink? And then lastly, the topic of this talk, which is the touch tone um, transponder. And the focus of all of uh, my satellites uh, are, the, I call it a ground terminal applications focus, because all the other satellites get all wrapped up in trying to put all kinds of physics and sensors on it. And if it's not doing physics and sensors and you know, watching the Earth or the ionosphere, it, it's not a satellite. You know? I, I'm talking about not amateur. I'm talking about trying to get a, a satellite approved at an institution. And I say, no, the focus here is just putting up a simple satellite and then focusing on what you can do on the ground because a heck of a lot more students can get involved than those that can actually build the satellite. Um, and, of course, we know that if you put it in an APRS uh, format, then you can use your radios just natively, and you have access to a tremendous amount of data. And I use this slide to show military application, and all these are our kids dressed up in special uniforms, and it's the same thing <laughs> as, as playing ham radio. The only problem is I used to use this slide 
And the FCC doesn't like it because it thinks we're trying to militarize ham radio. And no, I'm trying to amateur radio, well, whatever, the converse. Of but I like this slide because uh, this was our, one of our students who worked on one of our first satellites when he got to his first ship. He sent me this picture. He says, guess what? My skipper is uh, W4HFZ, the ops boss uh, is a ham, and the... Um, Chief engineer is a ham. Here we are standing, communicating with uh, PC, uh, PCSAT and using nothing but a Palm Pilot and an APRS hand, handheld. None of this other stuff belonging to the submarine has anything to do with that communications. And I love the quote uh, from uh, then Captain Ch uh, Chaz Richard, when you, have, when you surface and you have no comms at all, 1200 baht is pretty good. <laughs> and believe me, he did. The first th antenna that came up on his submarines is AX-25 packet radio um, because he was the, what's the, the first submarine, the one that goes on, uh, Nautilus, has a ship that follows it around because it, it only goes down and up. It doesn't go distance. And so when he surfaces, where's our support ship? And the AX-25 link is always the first one that comes up. So the other, now, besides the ground terminal application focus, if you put all of the APR satellites on the same frequency, you can do dual hops, just like we do on Earth. And so this is the, uh, the one that I captured. Catch my breath. But to make that work, uh, you've got to be in the footprint of one of the satellites, and you've got to make sure the other satellite has nobody in the, in the footprint, because otherwise it's listening to thousands of packets, and it's not going to hear this weak signal from uh, 2,000 uh, 2, kilometers away. And so this one just happened to work because... There we are on the uh, East Coast, not very many people in the footprint, and we heard that packet. By the way, every telemetry packet from every APRS satellite is transmitted via two hops. So uh, once a minute, four satellites all around the world is somebody trying to make two hops. And so every now and then I'll look at the downlink and just see if I happen to capture any of those. Uh, so this is kind of what the APRS satellite le network looks like these days. You got all the previous and uh, future satellites, um, all the people that want to play on the ground. You've got the internet links, ground stations, the whole internet thing, APRS.FI, find you and everything else. But for the last couple of years, we have these people playing without. It was initially outer net and then out net. And they're trying to get uh, money to develop uh, internet for all anywhere on earth. And they do come up with receiver kits for under 100 bucks that you could put together, put an antenna outside, point it at a geostationary satellite, and now you get a continuous uh, stream making you an internet hotspot uh, for people to access, you know, weather and news and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and they're looking for low data rate channels that they can distribute around the world. So we said, how about the APRS channel? Now, of course, the APRS channel would totally overload their... Uh, pipeline. So I said, okay, how about just the APRS satellite downlinks? And so uh, findyou.com uh, is listening to every satellite, every packet on, the, uh, on APRS that happens to come from the satellite. He sends it over to their uplink ground station. And so there's always a file on that uh, low data rate downlink anywhere on earth that has the most recent live uh, APRS satellite traffic. The point here is, if you talk about uh, first responders, you can go anywhere on Earth because they have three satellites, three geostationary satellites, and again, just a patch antenna outside kind of pointed in an approximate direction will receive it. Now, the problem is they're dependent on voluntary funding and everything else, and so they had a great system that was using the Inmarsats, uh, three of them geostationary, and they, they lost that channel, and then they found another channel. So right now their receivers are KU band, and so you have to have a little bit of gain, maybe a, a, a dish network, a dish. Um, and it's hard to keep up with them because they have to move to wherever a satellite will give them, donate a free channel or a low-cost channel, and then they have to build a receiver to match it. But it's hackers that are not hams. But there's nothing wrong with them carrying our amateur traffic. Um, so uh, if you go to findyou.com, which is collecting every packet ever transmitted on APRS, uh, the, the, the top of the page shows you the, uh, the APRS satellite uh, users who have been heard. This is a tabulated list uh, by age. 
you click there and you can zoom in on maps and see exactly where they are. But the bottom of that page is all the raw packets. And you can see if it's from users or the satellites itself or whatever. But uh, I don't even bother with the ground station anymore because all I got to do is go to findyou.com, look at the bottom, and I can see the last packet from my satellite anywhere on Earth. Um, so I get pretty lazy. Another findyou.com uh, um, page showing stations listed by uh, uh, distance from my station. That's more of a terrestrial application. Uh, oh, by the way, and of course, you can click this button for messages and see what his message traffic is, you know, texting. And, you know, we've been doing that for two decades now. Uh, and of course, it's all tied into APRS.FI, the people, the military people who come through my lab, and I show them all this, and then I click, I, uh, click on this guy's house in Kalamazoo or whatever and zoom all the way in, and you can see the antenna on his house. And the military is pretty impressed with that. Um, plus, back in the good old days, uh, find you kept every packet forever until they ran out of disk space. But this is almost a full year's uh, telemetry data, and I didn't have to do anything except I just send a URL uh, identifying which satellite it is, which telemetry, uh, which channel of the five channel standard APRS telemetry I'm interested in, what time period I'm interested in, boom, I got a plot. So again, I didn't, we never even bothered with the ground station because it, it's all done for us. This is showing us what? The uh, solar, the, the temperature on the uh, solar panels, and this is the temperature on the battery. And so you can see where we go through periods of full sun uh, every now and then. Uh, but again, with a ground terminal application focus, there's all kinds of things you can do. This, this bunch of students were going to uh, build a buoy, go out and plant it on the ice, um, up in the Arctic and then wait till the, for the ice to melt and then see where it went. And so we put an APRS uh, transponder on that with a tiny tracker 4 and of course never saw it again because at the time we didn't have any APRS satellites that go high enough in latitude to be able to see the Arctic. But we, th we went through the process anyway. Oh, and we had hoped that PSAT-2 would have been launched by then, but it didn't. And then we also found three years into the project that PSAT-2 was only going to get a 28 degree inclination orbit, which is no better than ISS. Of course, uh, if you're talking about remote sensors, uh, everybody's launching balloons now. And the thing about balloons is, though, once they go out of the ocean, you never hear from them again until they hit landfall. And then, somewhere along the way, it had to change frequencies to the European frequency. And of course, all that's gone away. Bill Brown, you'll hear him talk tomorrow night. Now you can build an HF transmitter the size of a matchbox using Whisper and track it all over the world and, uh, and run it on solar power, and it'll last for weeks in several orbits of the Earth. But anyway, the idea was if you want to uplink uh, anywhere on Earth where you're not over a terrestrial thing, you can do it on the uh, APRS channel. This is just showing you that there are balloons everywhere. I mean, the size of a big matchbox. No, no, no. Uh, I think I got a picture. I think I took it out. Uh -huh. No, uh, th the Whisper ones are now down to about the size of a 3 by 5 card, and that is a thin card, and then it has two little uh, things sticking out and a little solar panel. So yeah, it's about this size, yeah. The APRS one is the same thing. Okay. So anyway, uh, a, a lot of things to do there, but again, unless you have ground stations, you're going to lose data. Of course, now, th even... The VHF one solved that problem because in addition to transmitting their current position, they transmit a sample of some historical packets. So when it does eventually get over uh, another set of ground stations, it will slowly accumulate the historical thing, and then Bill Brown's web pages or the high altitude balloon pages puts all that together and refills in then where it went. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. Here's one that I haven't seen anybody follow through with, and I think it's fantastic. It's a, an ARL project, um, Maria. And the idea was uh, schools would build these little rovers, uh, Lego rovers, and take them outside, tune them to the ISS frequency, and then a school on one side of the 1,000-foot kilometer footprint or whatever can send commands to your rover, and you can send commands to theirs. And wouldn't that be neat? Um, so here's a re the remote sensor baseline. Back in 2006, we built our first one with a, uh, what is that, Yeezy? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I used to know that one. Um, and then, a, a, you know, a full-size KPC-3 and a GPS on the top, and it fit in this thing. And the most expensive thing was the uh, PVC pipe that's six inches in diameter, which cost $30 for the two pieces. 
Uh, and now, whoops, and now, of course, we're down to uh, just the size of the GPS, and this will fit in a two-inch pipe along with a bunch of D cells and lasts for months and months. Um, and what we showed here is that if you have a little uh, one, uh, five watt transmitter anywhere on Earth within the uh, latitude range of the satellites, if we have two satellites in orbit and you are transmitting once a minute uh, with five watts, you have a 100% uh, probability that you will get anywhere from three to t 11 samples of that device uh, a day. So what we're after is how many satellites can we get up there? Uh, then PSAT, uh, PCSAT-1 went into uh, negative uh, uh, power budget, kind of shut itself down, but still we had PCSAT-2 at the same time, and so with only one of them, we were down to where you, you got at least guaranteed one, maybe as high as five packets per day. But notice that PCSAT-2, which was attached to the outside of the space station's performance, was actually worse than the performance of PCSAT-1, always be PCSAT-2. Why? How much RFI do you think there are in other emitters and everything else going on on the space station to which you are attached? Um, so this is the, as I started off, the uh, concept or operation for PSAT-2. And um, what I'm going to talk about, I've already talked about then all the VHF applications. This is the HF uplink and UHF downlink, uh, which also includes the slow scan TV camera. And the idea is it's full duplex. So you turn on your 10 meter transmitter um, when it comes into view and you just transmit PSK31 all you want and type all your buddies who are listening out there. And of course you've got the parallel uh, DigiPan software that's displaying what everybody's doing and you see everybody in real time and it's a great uh, group uh, uh, camaraderie. But if you're not compensating for Doppler, although we're down to 10, uh, 10 meters, you still have one, a maximum of one hertz per second Doppler uh, change. And um, uh, at the early part of a pass and towards the end of a pass, that's well within almost any PSK31 software to decode. But uh, one, uh, right in the middle of the pass, you're going to lose some data because the, the Doppler shift is so great. So uh, Andrew Flowers wrote a piece of software uh, to just be a PSK31 transmit only piece of software. And now, of course, now you can operate full duplex. So you operate DigiPan or whatever your favorite uh, uh, PSK31 receiver is on your PC. And then you have the other, this stuff, uh, generating the transmit audio. And it pre-compensates. You, you download the elements for the satellite. And it pre-compensates on the uplink for uh, your position. And so then you have a straight, perfectly good uh, railroad track and everybody who is using this, again, not only has the advantages of they have full duplex PSK31 because they're using separate software for the uplink and the downlink, and, and you should have a pretty good, exciting system. Um, but again, if we can get most of the PSK31 users to stay down here below a, a kilohertz, we got all this spectrum here, and that's where we can put in a, uh, uh, a slow scan TV camera. And so students at Brno University, um, uh, Thomas Urbanek and... Uh, Oh, uh, yeah, Wagner. Wagner, I'm not sure. Uh, they built this uh, two-board system, which is a linear 10-meter receiver at the FM transmitter. See, the beautiful thing is we avoid the UHF Doppler because we come down on UHF FM. You do have to you know, click through five steps to stay within your FM bandwidth, but you don't have linear addition of that Doppler. And uh, so this is the gallery, and uh, the people send in their images. <coughs> Uh, wherever they receive them, and then he puts them into this gallery page. And we've gotten some pretty good images. And if you go there and you click on this one, you will see the best image, the, the best image captured by somebody on Earth of that image. And then you will also see another display page of all the other ones that people sent in that weren't quite so good. So he's always filtering to the top uh, the best images. Now I'm going to give a little demonstration. Don't no, I'm not because uh, let's try video one more time. Thank you. And we are waiting. I think it's a cable. Uh, okay, it could be a cable. Well, can we ch you can just ch uh, change red to red? Yeah, we can do that. I, I think it's maybe a Tweety what's coming through. 
true problem. Yeah. Yeah, that could be it. Now try video. Now you're you got that okay. Select. But it says it was off. Okay. Uh, but of course, all I was going to do here is demonstrate what we've been doing since 1995, the VCH1. How many people have a VCH1? How many of you have used it in the last 10 years? Okay. Um, but the point is, every single one of you, how many of you have a smartphone? Okay. Everybody in this room has a slow scan TV receiver, right? Hold up, download the SSTV app, hold it next to your, uh, your walkie-talkie, and when somebody's slamming slow scan TV, you receive the image. All right? Here you are, first responder. You're the first guy on the scene. You didn't bring any of your stuff with you. You take a picture of the accident. You hold it, your uh, smartphone next to your radio, key it, and now you can transmit the image back to the EOC. We, uh, we used to lament the loss of the VCH1, but now everybody's got one. Why aren't we doing more with slow scan TV? Come as you are is what emergency communications is all about. Um, and so I would love to get people, but of course I don't carry a smartphone, so this is what I have to carry. Now the, the, the concept here, you know of APRS, so I came up with the name APRN, which is Automatic Picture Relay Network. And the concept is, you have a frequency that's local. It would be nice if it was uh, national all across the country. You say, let's just pick one, 146.58. Imagine if anywhere in the United States you transmitted a slow scan image on 146.58 uh, and it was picked up by the local APRN receiver, which is just the receiver, feeds that image into uh, the APRN web page, and now you've got an image available anywhere in the world to see what you are seeing, and, and then you send an APRS packet message to the EOC saying image number 13 is the scene of the crime, okay? We've been able to do that for 20 years. I've been talking about it for 20 years, and now we have, everybody has slow scan TV in the palm of their hands, and uh, we keep moving forward and not realizing uh, we have all this capability. And I've lost my clicker. Okay. You've got too many gadgets. Yeah, and I don't know how to operate any of them. Okay. Uh, this slide has nothing to do with this talk. It's just that I'm kind of proud of it. Um, and just like I don't know where I'm going to cut the holes until the satellite is built, uh, I don't know where I'm going to do the antenna release because I don't know the links of the antennas until the satellite is built and everything is built, and then you get to kind of do uh, SWR measurements. And so you end up with the idea that um, I've got four antennas, Two of them are six inches long, one of them is 20 inches long, and one of them is uh, six feet long. I've got to find a place somewhere on that satellite where they all come together at one tip, and that's where I can put my burn resistor. All right? So what I do is I just make sure that I have a ground rail and a burn trace on every single solar panel, and so I don't even worry about it till the whole satellite is built. And then you'd play, uh, just in an hour or two, you play origami with how can I wrap all of these satellites around this satellite such that they all arrive right there. I solder the resistor on there, tie a piece of fishing line around it, and I'm done. And everybody who sees that says, what a kludge. And so we have students every year for 10 years now coming up with all kinds of antenna deployment systems. None of them work. <laughs> no, or none of them were anything that I would fly and, and, and rely on, whereas this absolutely is always going to work. Um, one other thing I do on satellites is I always have a 555 timer that's watching the PTT on the transceiver to make sure that it's always at least once a minute is transmitting. If it ever stops that, the 555 removes timer, uh, removes power from the TNC, and so you get a complete uh, uh, power-up reboot. And that has served me well for 18 years. Uh, so therefore, the 555 is the most important chip. So instead of buying a $2,000 RAD hard certified uh, 555 timer, I just take a, a standard 555 timer, glue a piece of lead to the top and the bottom, and I'm done. And of course, the reason I use lead is because when you buy the $2,000 chip, what do you find? It has a layer of cap uh, tantalum on the top and tantalum on the bottom. So I looked up, why do they use tantalum? Why am I spending $2,000 for this? 
Tantalum is twice as dense as lead, so instead of being a 16th inch of lead, they got a 32nd inch of tantalum. I'm getting the same shielding. So anyway, uh, let's see where we're going with this. So now we're going to talk about DTMF voice. Uh, how much time do I have left? Plenty? Oh, I, I can do this. Um, so this is the purpose of this talk, because I've been talking about using touch tones, which is in every radio, just like your slow scan TV imager is in every one of your cell phones. Everybody can send data. I'm tired of showing up uh, that our local ham club still cannot plan an event around APRS. Because it used to be, you know, 5% of the people would show up with APRS. Now, 50% of the people can show up with APRS, but what do you do with the other 50% of the volunteers that show up with an IC2AT? Uh, you know, you've... You need to involve these people, so you design your event around what's the lowest common denominator, and we have uh, head headquarters, this is checkpoint three, we just had the runner 13 pass, uh, you know, and, and look, look at what you're doing to your voice channel. Nobody can get any information through because somebody's talking about something, and you're afraid, even when the channel is quiet, you're afraid somewhat to call net control because you know he's probably busy as a one-armed paper hanger in there, and the last thing he needs is some other idiot calling him and saying, well, you know, do you know what time it is? Um, so anyway, the idea is if you could just start using the, your data radios that you have in your pocket, uh, there's just so much we, more we can do with ham radio. So this whole um, DTMF concept started with QuickCom 2, which was the next satellite uh, in the row. And let's see if this demo works. And so I have the QuickCom 2 flight hardware in the next room, because, well actually it's the engineering model, because the FCC would not let us fly it because they said it was built by students from, at a federal institution who are paid employees and therefore it cannot be an amateur satellite. We fought that battle for four years and we finally, we, uh, we finally won on PSAT-2, the satellite I'm talking about today, but QuickCom 2 was the one before it, and it had been on the launcher for a, a, a year due to its delays. And so now we had three weeks to do the same thing we had done that satisfied the FCC to go through both the FCC and the NTIA to get approval. And NTIA said it only takes four years. There's no way we're going to do this in two weeks. So this thing had to be removed from the launcher. And so I have two flight units ready to go. So here's, here's what QuickCom 2 would do. And uh, so I'm going to send my uh, grid. And it didn't work. Let's see, let's try again. Okay, lousy uh, uh, text to voice. Um, but I wanted to give you a, 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 a taste of how much we improved when we came up with PSAT 2. But the idea is you, you send your grid square and call sign, and not only does it come down with voice so that you who do not have APRS get confirmation that it worked, but you heard the packet at the end, which came down to the global APRS network, and so now everybody knows what happened then. Um, okay, so here's what finally made it possible. If you try to put a six-character call sign into any of the normal uh, DTMF d uh, encoding or touch tone uh, coding algorithms, it's going to take anywhere from 9 to 18, if you use one scheme, uh, key presses, or it's going to take always 12. Well, if you take 12 and a DTMF memory is only 16 and you've got to have a start character and an end character, you only got two characters worth of information, and that just wasn't sufficient. So I came up with this scheme, and it made this all possible, and that is if we assume a start uh, character, you know, star up, pound down, uh, I can have a four-character, a four-digit data field, and then I just take W, which is the nine key, B, which is, you just spell out your call, not using any coding mechanism, just look where the characters are, spell your call sign out. Then what you have to do is put a four-character code that tells the, uh, the system where on these keys that letter was. So this is the first letter, that's the second letter, that's the zeroth letter is the numeric. The first letter on the uh, two key is the A. The first letter on the seven key is the P. And the second character on the seven is... So you see, I end up with a six-digit, two, bit, two bits per digit. That's 12 bits. In 12 bits, I can encode into a four-digit decimal number, and that's the code. 
you only need to look this up once because you know how to spell your call sign and you just spell that as is. And this is the only thing you need to know that makes your call sign unique. So that's what made it possible to where now you can report your grid square anywhere on earth by having a four digit field here and always knowing that the call sign is gonna be 10 digits. So how do I get a four digit uh, grid square? The problem is, is if you try to do FM, now all of a sudden you got six characters and that doesn't fit. So I said, well, where are all the hams on earth and let's forget about anybody that's in any other grid square. And I came up with 99 grid squares um, on earth where hams probably live. And so the first digit is what country it's in and the second digit is which of the 10 uh, grids in that uh, country uh, uh, you're in. And so now I have a four digit uh, grid square all over the earth. Okay, so now here's what, these are CAN messages, uh, here's what PSAT 2 sounds like. Now where's this audio gonna come out? It's gonna come out on here, can you hold a microphone? Is it all gonna work? I don't believe it. Uh, no, I got, how, how do I, I've got it over here. Nah, it's not gonna work. Uh, I, I, this is the first time I've ever tried to put sound into a uh, PowerPoint. Uh, but anyhow, it's going to say the same thing, but it's going to be a much better voice. It's going to say, uh, all it has to see is 1819 in my call sign, and it's going to say grid FM19 from WB4APR CQ number blank. It's going to add a number on the end. The purpose for that number is the guy who wants to QSL me is not going to be able to type 10 digits worth of my call sign. So all he has to do is type... Um, B0, so say I said this is CQ number three. So he sends B, which says this is the code for a QSL response, uh, and I'm gonna choose, uh, uh, the response is 03, and it's gonna be message number 40, and um, the response, really all he has to do is enter three, three characters, B03, which is this, and then hit memory, send out your call sign, and now you've sent the complete message. So, um, so when, so now it'll say W3XYZ says message number 40, QSL your CQ number three, my number is five, because now there've been some other ones. So now he, the other guy could QSL number five and you've got a two-way contact and you only entered three digits and sent the, the transmission. Okay, but if you notice on the end of that voice, there was also the APRS packet. So that's in, uh, it's been converted to APRS using the standard APRS grid square format, and there's the CQ numbers. And so we were up to CQ number 59, I guess back on the 15th of August, and I, uh, 81, 82, well actually it looks like it rolled over and then started over again. Uh, we could only have 99 uh, CQ numbers. Okay, so that's how we do grid squares and grid square QSL response. But no notice the response was actually a message. Well, how do we do messages? Well, what we noticed is that anything in ham radio has already been said before, so we just picked the top 99 things that anybody's ever said, put them in memory up there, and now it's like the, the joke of the guys in the jailhouse. They just tell jokes by number. And so you, you just send up the number um, to select the message, but we have four characters, so why not use the other two characters at a modifier? So we can put blanks in all those messages, so you can choose the message you want to speak and what number you want inserted into a blank if it exists. And so I was gonna give a demo here. Uh, I had no reason to believe that this will work either, but let's just give it a, give it a try. Now, okay. And so this one would say, oh, I've got another slide I think that shows, oh, so there's the, the list, just some of the 99 messages on board. And of course what they are is the ARL, all of the ARL, ARL radiograms and I believe there's two tables worth. There's the, you know, happy birthday, how are you? And then there's the emergency ones. And then we added, there was still room for about 30 or 40 more, and we added some more. And they're in the uh, paper. Uh, and again, I doubt this is going to work, but um, I'm glad we have the Army here today. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you just say message number 73 with a modifier of 57, it's going to come back and says WB4APR says message number 73, greetings from AMSAT, keeping amateur radio in space for 57 years. If you happen to choose uh, C means message 43, and in this case the modifiers aren't used, so you can put any digits there, and WB4APR says message number 43, go Navy, beat Army. So 
that is, uh, the, was the culmination of uh, 27 years at Naval Academy, all the satellites I built, and uh, here's where we are today. Uh, all of the satellites worked. QuickCom 1 was another one. That was still in the FCC fiasco. It was sent up to the ISS for a year, uh, attached to a, a host payload. The host payload was never allowed to turn on for a whole year because they had um, FCC licensing issues as an experimental service. And here they're flying an, uh, an APRS amateur payload, which has FCC issues, and the FCC in, insisting that the NTIA get involved. So after a year of that, they finally got permission to send it, and the host never worked and never powered us up, and so who knows what went wrong. But that's, uh, that's my only failure. But it made it to space, and it sat on the ISS for a year. Um, so anyway... Uh, the, the advantage of these 27 years was getting down from a full 10-inch card with KPC 9612s and uh, Hamtronics uh, transceivers down to this 3.5-inch card. And this is kind of the evolution uh, down to the 3.5-inch card. Uh, same thing, more the same. The problem with PSAT-2 orbit is it was only in a 28-degree inclination orbit. So if you're about mid-latitude, you could always see it. But in the northern states... Uh, on uh, low passes, uh, you couldn't see it. Um, but the thing about satellites is people th like to think satellites are up. No, satellites are never up. They're out there, you know, between about 0 to 20 degrees. They spend 70% of all their time there in view below 20 degrees. So forget about the elevation. Just point within 20 degrees of the horizon. The converse of that is, there's a button here to push, that if you put up an omni receiver... You're only going to receive in this very center section, but you're going to have a 10 dB stronger signal. And you're not going to be wearing out any parts in your ASL tracker and everything else. It'll work forever, lasts a long time, and it's dirt cheap. It's just a, let's see if that's the next slide. No, uh, uh, next, yeah. All you can have is a Raspberry Pi, uh, a, a, a dongle receiver, an omni antenna, and you are an automatic uh, tracking ground station. Let me go back, uh, yeah, this one. Uh, the one thing, although it, it's this low uh, latitude, it is highly elliptical, 300 and 800 kilometers, and that vary, that swaps every two weeks. So if this week the, the best passes are low on the horizon, next week they'll be 15 degrees higher. And the, the thing is, is that in Europe, remember Europe is 15 degrees higher than most of the United States, so basically there are no Europeans on this satellite except for a couple of days every other week when they can barely see it above the horizon. Big disappointment. All this work, and we never, they never told us what our latitude was going to be, or at least our launch inclination, or at least we weren't really paying attention, or we said, well, 28 degrees, the ISS does that, that's fine, except the ISS doesn't. I'm remembering the shuttle. So anyway, moving right along, one unique thing about the PSAT uh, orbit uh, if you did on Instatrack, this is uh, two weeks worth of time, you'll notice that for at 3 o'clock on this day, uh, just five minutes later every day for a week, you're going to have a pass. And so you don't even need no stinking uh, uh, tracking program. And, of course, there's always a, a pass 90 minutes later or 90 minutes earlier. So anyhow, you just keep listening around 3 o'clock plus five minutes, and then when you don't hear anymore, you just sl uh, slip 90-some-odd uh, minutes earlier and so it's a very easy thing to do when you're mobile out in the field and everything else is to know that, um, oh, um, how about pushing that button, sir, in the back? Push the transmit button and let's just see. Just push the TX button. It's, it's transmitting? I bet the radio fell asleep. Well, anyway, he was going to transmit slow scan TV. <laughs> um, but since we can't receive and display it, I, I think everybody knows what it sounds like, so I don't need to do that. Um, so, all the excitement. We have two new satellites in orbit. We had a total of eight working APRS satellites in June when PSAT-2 and its sister satellite, uh, US and AP-1, were launched together. And so I finally decided, let's bring all this onto one web page. And so if you go to aprs.org, sats.html, you have all of our satellites. The first link is a description. The second link is the telemetry for the last 24 hours. The third one is all the user AX25 packets. Uh, then there's this uh, list of all the uh, DTMF grids, because that can be captured because it gets converted to uh, APRS packet. Then you can look at the bus voltage and temperatures, telemetry, battery current, and everything else. And then you can look at the telemetry counter. 
And you can do that for uh, all the satellites. So this is the first eight that are first four. And then the bottom half of that page is the other four. Oh, oh the top four were, were all built at the Naval Academy. The other five that we built have all since deorbited. Um, but then there's the one on the ISS, ASAT from India. Lapin Z is in an equatorial orbit. If you live down near the equatorial, you've got to pass every 90 minutes all day long, except when they turn it on and off. And then there's the Air Force Academy, which turned over uh, Falcon Sat 3 for a 9600 baud APRS digipeating. That's why there's a solid line here. Every one of these above is on 145825. So you tune that frequency, and you're never more than a half hour or an hour from having some APRS satellite come overhead. Um, so when you click on looking at the, see, there's the standard APRS, very simple. Uh, health and welfare telemetry packet. It starts with a, the telemetry number, and usually you transmit it once a minute, so that's basically counting the minutes. The first channel is always the voltage, and you see the voltage is well above the fully discharged NICADs and uh, uh, is uh, well up in the full charge region. The next one is the current. The next two are the plus and minus Z temperatures, and you see that we are staying in a nice temperature range, uh, average about 5 degrees C, very comfortable temperature for the spacecraft. Uh, and then you cl can click on the, uh, the, these are all just URL calls to find you, and find you just gives you all this data. Um, so if I, I, I st started putting the telemetry counter on there, because it's kind of nice to watch that thing go up to 999 and start over. Now right about here, there was a reset. We don't know why. It could have been, because we were, haven't been paying real attention. This thing's going to be up for the next five or ten years, so I had plenty of time through retirement to retire and then finally play with my satellites. And we may have been just sending a command to just see if the reset circuitry worked and everything else. Um, the problem was, that was the last packet I ever heard from PSAT-2 on the VHF downlink. So here... I'd written a paper, I'd scheduled this talk, here I am to talk about the, the next five years of playing with amateur radio and APRS on PSAT-2, and it just vanished. Uh, the sister satellite that went up with it is using the same TinyTrack2 comms board, and guess what? It was dead on launch, and then one month later it came alive. Now, I had nothing to do with that satellite, and that thing is, has processors. Even the battery has a processor. It's lithium and all that kind of stuff. And so the presumption is, is that it never even powered up the VHF comm until a month in orbit when it finally had enough power or something. And so now it's alive and well. So is it my tiny track 4 in space that's having a problem, or is it my power system or his? Oh, by the way, when I say PSAT 2 died, the VHF died. Still, the UHF, the slow scan TV, the PSK31, all that stuff is still working just fine. Um, so now we realized watching these telemetry counters is very useful. So USNA P1, which was launched along with it, notice it never gets quite up to 100 minutes because a full orbit is 100 minutes. So what it's doing is it's lasting somewhere about, I mean, it's fully operational in the sun, it's counting up, and then it starts to, then it hits eclipse and it crashes. Uh, every now and then, it, it does a little bit more. But anyway, so now we said, uh, let's go back and look at the uh, telemetry counter on PCSAT, which has been in orbit for uh, 18 years. And what it does is it, when it comes into the sun, it takes 45 minutes before it even charges up enough to s send a single packet. Then it can s uh, send packets for about 15 minutes before it uh, resets to zero when it goes into the eclipse. And then we've got the uh, PSAT, which has been up to, since 2015, and it has been working very reliable, but only for a month at a time. Then it gets bad power for a month, and then good power for a month. Right now, it's starting to come back into good power. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about, which I have completely out of time, is the whole purpose of PSAT-2 was to demonstrate to the world what you can do with touch tones. And every ham on earth could walk out with his walkie-talkie and experience what you can do with touch-tone signaling. And I lost that. So this slide should tell you, though. But if you can put a full call sign, then you can do four digits worth of data uh, uh, anywhere on earth. If you are willing in a local event, uh, oh, in four digits, you can do worldwide grid square. You can do one-mile resolution position in a, in a city. You can do a 100-foot resolution at Hera Arena. Tenth of a mile resolution <laughs> along a marathon 
or 99 messages is 99 modifiers. There's un, uh, um, virtually unlimited what you can do. But if you're, it's a local event, usually it's always a local event because you're transmitting touch tones to the nearest engine that converts that to APRS. If you use uh, suffix call only, then you can use five digits for the call sign, and now you have nine digits for data. That is a heck of a lot of data that you can send. Or if you assign everybody in the marathon event or something a, a, a call sign 0 to 999, you have 11 digits for data. That's virtually unlimited. Marathon, for example, uh, you can get tenth of a mile resolution along the event just by sending a three-digit number, the mile and tenth. Or uh, you know, the, the map that you hand out to every participant can have an XY grid. And now with uh, uh, two digits of X and two digits of Y, you can get to within 100 uh, feet anywhere uh, in the area. Uh, of course, APRS has always had mile markers, so uh, six digits, you can enter, send the three-digit uh, interstate that you're on and the three-digit mile marker, and instantly, instantly, not only are the people on the local repeater know where you are, but worldwide, you're in the APRS system, they can zoom in and see that you're passing through Kalamazoo. Uh, time's up, right? Okay, uh, so here's where I said uh, just one digit of horizontal resolution and one digit of vertical resolution, and you can put yourself within 100 feet anywhere at uh, Dayton. And so back several years ago, we wrote some software that did that. Here's the thing that says, the, the page that has the uh, Dayton map, if they just put these tick marks along the side, you could say, I'm in this hotel here, which means I'm at 4704, and you'll show up on the APRS map worldwide, uh, and everybody's... Uh, uh, APRS radio in the area and people can see where you are. Lastly, if only thing you send is your call sign, let's just say on 146.58 in the local area, or just on your local repeater, forget it, on your local repeater that has a DTMF decoder, you just send your call sign. What do you do when you get in your car? You say WB4 APR mobile. That lets everybody know that right now I'm open for contacts. But if you simply sent your call sign, Not only does that accomplish the same, well, it's listening. Not only does that accomplish the same thing as saying WB4 APR mobile, which probably three people on the planet heard, <laughs> that that packet went worldwide and it puts you on the map at this location in kind of a list on the map, APRS, any APRS map, because the touchstone decoder here is going to build a list of positions of everybody who's heard on touch tones and included in that packet is the frequency of the repeater, the tone, and the, uh, you know, when the, the weekly meetings are, all that information is normally in a, uh, a voice repeater packet. And so now all the people in your club, you can keep track of where they are or at least what frequency they're on. And, you know, you click on that and you see when was the last time he, he was heard. So, um, you can build these little, here's my first attempt at an APRS, uh, Touchstone engine, I'm real close to the end. Um, Tiny Track 4, the Tiny Track 4 DTMF decoder that you can buy from uh, Bionics, and then a little basic stamp. Of course, everybody these days would use an Arduino and a battery, and that is a marathon processor that can do all this stuff for APRS Touchstone. In addition, <coughs> what's the thing about a marathon? It takes two hours and five minutes for the lead runner to cross the finish line. I don't care who he is, and I don't care if he dies along the way. It's going to be two hours and, and two to two hours and nine minutes. So APRS has always done lead runner projection. And so that's why there's two buttons on the front of this. One of them says, go a minute ahead, and the other one says, go back a minute. And so this thing is generating the position of the lead runner to the APRS and the world and everything else. And every time you, the operator, hear that the lead runner, is, uh, he just came into sight just now, cross mile marker 13. I look at my map and I say, well, that's about a minute ahead, push that button. So um, anyway, there's all kinds of things you can do with this. And I will, uh, last slide. Uh, we put a D700 control head on the top of the pad where the headquarters writes down all of these troop numbers and the score of each troop and everything else, and he's bu busier than a one-armed paper hanger. And the last thing he wanted to do will, with was packets. And I said, just try it. And so out here in the field, all I have to do is send 87442, enter. That shows up. Station number seven just made a report. He clicks on that, and there's the data. He writes down 87442 from station seven. Done. 
That, and he didn't, there was not a single transmission on voice, and we, you weren't clogging up the channel. Works fantastically. And so we said, now we're going to do it uh, with DTMF. You can download off-the-shelf touch-tone decoding software to display at headquarters anywhere else what people are sending in. And the next event, we were all set up to do this, and the problem was every single person in the club had bought an APRS radio, and so we didn't need to do the DTMF. That's it. So in summary, look for those applications where you can transmit numerical data of, of great value. 